So let's start with our first presentation, and I have the privilege of introducing Anish Narayanan, and his mentor is Dr. Avni Shabra, and the talk is Density Analysis of Spontaneous Extremity Fractures Using 3D Computed Tomography, a Case Control Study. Come and present to us. All right, thank you for the introduction. So the first thing I would want to address is, well, what is a spontaneous fracture? And basically, a spontaneous fracture is a fracture that occurs without some sort of clear external cause. The key thing to emphasize, though, is that spontaneous fractures and pathologic fractures aren't really the same thing. Pathologic fractures, there's usually some sort of secondary disease pathology or some underlying pre-existing lesion that's responsible for the, spontaneous fra for the fracture. In spontaneous fractures, there's no, no such clear etiology like that. So in that case, you might be wondering, well, what causes spontaneous fracture? And the most common cause is osteoporosis. And it's estimated that there are over 200 million people who have osteoporosis, and that one in every three women and one every five men will eventually have a fragility fracture as a result of this osteoporosis. And hip fractures in particular are known to be del deleterious, having major morbidity and mortality. So what can clinicians do to assess the osteoporotic state of the bone? And currently, the imaging modality of choice, the gold standard, is the DEXA scan. And this gives us an x-ray showing the aerial density of the bone from which we can get a T-scores to see if a patient lies in the osteopenic or osteoporotic ranges. However, by nature of being a 2D projection, it's pretty limited. You can't really get the 3D geometry of the bone. Furthermore, especially in the older populations that we're interested in imaging, you are suspect to a lot of different calcification artifacts, aortic calcification, soft tissue calcification, that could raise the measured bone mineral density. Finally, the changes on DEXA are really slow to progress, so it's really hard to use it with repeated imaging to follow disease or treatment course. So what is the alternative? What can we do to address all of these shortcomings? Well, it turns out that CT imaging it's, well, it gives you 3D anatomic data. It's routinely available. There are CT scanners everywhere versus having a specialized equipment like DEXA would require. Uh, it's routinely obtained, so you could uh, chart easily um, a person's bone density. And in the literature, at least quantitative CT has been used and has established bone density thresholds that match the DEXA T-scores. Unfortunately, though, routine CT without those calibratory phantoms hasn't been as well studied in the use for studying osteoporotic bone. So that's what our project aims to do. We hypothesize that on routine CT, spontaneous fracture patients should have reduced bone density in comparison to appropriately matched controls. So how do exactly do we go about selecting the cases in the study? Well, we had 522 patients that we took from the Parkland PACs who had some fracture admission between 2013 and 2016. We didn't know exactly what the cause of the fracture was, so the first thing we did was we went through the case history in the EPIC chart, and we excluded any trauma, malignancy, um, any like renal pathology, or any history of prior hardware or surgery at the site of the fracture. This left us with about 163 spontaneous fracture cases, so you can see that like here. Once we had those 163 cases, we subdivided by anatomic location, which gave us a oh, Sorry, just scroll up a little bit. Oh, very sensitive. Okay, it gave us 35 hip fracture cases from which we were able to find 24 spontaneous femoral fracture cases ultimately. So what about the controls though? Well, we compared them to patients who had KUVCT imaging done as part of a workup for kidney stones. And once we age and sex match those patients, we found that there was no significant differences between our case and control group in all these uh, different demographic parameters, age, sex, BMI. So, okay, so now we had our cases and we had our controls. What's the next step? What kind of imaging work do we need to do? And this is where myself, as well as Anthony Kai, another medical student, came in. We drew these ROIs. These are kind of a little bit small to see here, but there's these little, oh, there's these little red circles in the trabecular bone that we drew. And these are three centimeter circles that were drawn at the side of the fracture, proximal to the side of the fracture in the femoral head, and distal to the side of the fracture in the lesser trochanter. And these were drawn both on the side of the fracture as well as on the contralateral side. And for each of these ellipses, we recorded the mean Hounsfield units. And this, once again, just a reminder, is just the trabecular bone. We didn't sample any of the cortical bone in these three centimeter ROIs. 
So once this was done, we were able to form three different comparisons. We compare the case fracture side to the contralateral non-fracture side in the patients with a spontaneous fracture and found there were significant differences in the density observed at and distal to, but not proximal to the fracture site. Then we made measurements and observed between the case fracture and the control non-fracture and found there were significant differences proximal and distal to, but not at the fracture site. Finally, we did the same thing for case non-fracture and control non-fracture and observed a similar pattern. Uh, significant differences proximal and distal, but not at the fracture site. I think this is a little bit more intuitive though in this box and whisker plot, which shows the results of the Hounsfield distribution. So you can see these blue bars here, they correspond to the mean Hounsfield unit density at this, on the fracture side. So this is proximal, at, and distal. We also have numbers for the contralateral side, proximal, at, and distal, as well as in the control patients. And you can see here, if you were looking at the fracture site where you might think the bone's the weakest, and you were to measure Hounsfield unit density, you can see here the contralateral side and the, the side that's fractured, the side that's fra fractured actually has higher bone density. And this is likely due to regular bone compression as well as hemorrhage. And this higher bone density could almost be mistaken for the, the density of the normal control bone. So if you're once trying to document a bone insufficiency, perhaps sampling at the site of the fracture is not the ideal location. In fact, it might be smarter to sample proximally or distally, particularly in this case for the femoral fractures proximally where we expect the bone to be densest, i.e. in the femoral head. And actually, we did a little bit of some statistics and calculated that in the femoral head, for every 50 Hounsfield unit decrease that was observed in the bone density, the risk of fracture, the odds ratio, increased by 74.4%. So this is just to show the interclass correlation coefficients between mine and Anthony's reads, and it shows pretty good agreement. Uh, limitations of this project. Um, the controls came from patients who had kidney stones or being worked up for kidney stones, so they might not represent the general healthy population. Another limitation was that six patients in the study had prior alendronate usage. However, the fractures weren't characteristic of a bisphosphonate use fracture, as those fractures would be um, distal to the lesser trochanter, <coughs> while all of our fractures were above it. So conclusions, basically there's little merit in measuring at the side of fracture to calculate or observe the reduced bone density and bone insufficiency. It's better to measure somewhere else, proximal or distal to that site. Future work, um, we have 88 knee subset of fractures that we are processing. We've also done uh, muscle and fat analyses for our femoral fractures that we're currently doing the statistics on. We could also correlate our findings with um, clinical measures like a timed up and go test as well as DEXA imaging. And I would just like to take a moment to, take my, to thank my mentor, Dr. Chubba, for allowing me to work in his lab under his guidance and he has a lot of great work going on in his um, group, and he always is willing to take on medical students. I'd also like to thank the second reader on the project, uh, Anthony Kai, as well as the MSTAR program for providing me the opportunity and the summer stipend to do this research. These are my references. Um, does anyone have any questions? First off, I want to thank you for another medical student working with our department doing research. We are very grateful to have you participating with us in working. And that's just another round of applause for a medical student doing a great job. Question in the back, Dr. Oz. How do your Hounsfield cut, point? cut points compare with those that have been established from opportunistic CT? say from colonography where uh, the spine has been looked at. So yeah, I did see like something in the literature just like looking at the vertebral spine doing similar things. I think I haven't done an, exp an explicit comparison with those findings, but it does seem similar in the conclusions that we got. Uh, let's see, I don't know. Slide is gonna... More questions. Okay. No more questions? Thank you very much, okay. Nish. We are very appreciative. And thank you to Dr. Chabra and Dr. Fielding for mentoring our medical students, too. We really appreciate your work in that. So.